Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man that only has two concerns, eyeliner and cigarettes. Ladies and gentlemen, here is the captain. Yes, yes, yes. You can find me on top of the trailer playing Master of Puppets. It's good to be seen and good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. On today's show, we will be sipping on this fabulous beer called Ruby from our friends at Fat Bottom Brewing Company. This is an American red ale with plenty of robust flavor without being overbearing. This beer is, of course, a beautiful ruby red color and a real crowd pleaser. Garage grade four out of five bottle caps. And here's some other crowd pleasers that helped us out with this week's beer fund. Let's give a cheers to Laurel in Whitefish, Montana. And a big shout out to Quentin in Durham, North Carolina. Here's a cheers that goes out to Laura in Baltimore, Maryland. And a big We Like Your Jib to Mara in Boise, Idaho. Here's a cheers to Anna in Woodbridge, Illinois. And last but certainly not least, ladies and gentlemen, a cheers to Casey and Darley, Australia. Everyone we mentioned, they went to TrueCrimeGarage.com and helped us out with this week's beer fund. And for that... We thank you. Yeah, B-W-E-R-U-N. For everything true crime, check out our website, truecrimegarage.com. There's a blog there. We have a store page. We have the music from every episode. And you can sign up on the mailing list so you can get discounts on the store page. And Colonel, that's enough of the business. All right, everybody, gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. must have been the devil himself that did it. That would be the only explanation that would make any sense at all in the heinous and horrific crimes that we are going to tell you about today. Two girls enjoying a beautiful day out together on their own in a remote area. They go missing from a public area accessible to all. This is a park that includes trails and the girls were taken from here in broad daylight. Later, they are found dead. They are the victims of an abduction and homicide. For someone to take and kill victims this young, and for the offender to take the risk that they did and get away with it, well then it must have been the devil himself. When we try to size up this monster, The first thing we all naturally question is, has he killed before? And we think, well, he must have. He must have done this before to be capable of such cruelty, to have such evil in his heart, to commit these crimes. If he has killed before, and if he is responsible for this double homicide, two young girls taken from a public place, well then he will most certainly do this again. How many nightmares will he create? But this sounds all too eerily familiar. Unfortunately, that is one of the parts of this nightmare that we know to be true. This last February makes five years unsolved since the murders of Libby German and Abigail Williams two young girls out hiking on a beautiful day in a remote area. They go missing from a public area accessible to all. They were taken in broad daylight and later found dead. When we first covered the Delphi murders case in May of 2017, no one here in the garage believed that five more years would pass and we would still be looking for the monster that committed those homicides. 
must be the devil himself. But now, just a little over a week, we're celebrating the independence of our great country. And as temperatures of the summer in the Midwest slowly but steadily climb, we are reminded of a double homicide. Another one. The killer is still unknown. A case that when we first covered it back in 2020, I would have thought could have, should have, some solution by now. But very sadly, I say tomorrow will make it 10 years now to the day. 10 years since that horrible day when someone or someone's took Elizabeth Collins and Lyric Cook. The two cousins were last seen riding their bikes together near Myers Lake just after noon in Evansdale, Iowa. Later, they were found dead. It must have been the devil himself. This is another look. A new look. The still unsolved and unresolved cases of Elizabeth Collins and Lyric Cook. The Evansdale murders. Ten years later. And this is True Crime Garage. Friday, July 13th, 2012, we have two little girls reported missing. This is eight-year-old Elizabeth Collins and her 10-year-old cousin, Lyric Cook. The two disappeared while out riding bikes together in Evansdale, Iowa. When they didn't return from the bike ride, the Evansdale Police Department was notified and the girls were reported missing. Lyric Cook's grandmother says she last saw the girls around 12.15 in the afternoon on that Friday the 13th. But we do end up with a few eyewitnesses who say they too saw the girls out on their bike ride. Evansdale is a small community, under 5,000 residents back in 2012 and still less than 5,000 people today. Evansdale is located in the northeastern part of the state of Iowa. Evansdale is in Black Hawk County, Iowa, and while this is more of a small town, it is very near Waterloo and Cedar Falls, cities that combined have over 100,000 people. The girl's grandmother, Wilma Cook, told the press she last saw the girls riding their bikes near downtown Evansdale about 12.15 p.m. July 13th. The girls were also seen at about 12.23 p.m. that same day. This on Brovan Boulevard in Evansdale. And then spotted between 12.30 and 1 p.m. on Gilbert Drive, not far from Myers Lake. Myers Lake is a recreational area and a popular fishing spot. These are the last known sightings of the girls. Let's talk about the girls here for a minute. So in the summer of 2012, eight-year-old Elizabeth Collins lived with her parents and siblings in Evansdale, Iowa. Evansdale is a blue-collar town with many residents involved in agriculture production in some manner. Elizabeth, who attended Pointer Elementary, was described by her mother as a bubbly little person who was always active and busy. One of her best friends was her cousin, Lyric Cook, age 10 who lived just minutes away in the next town over, Waterloo. Lyric went to Kingsley Elementary, and she was also an active, outgoing girl who loved bowling, cheerleading, and gymnastics and playing outside. Lyric and Elizabeth's mothers, Misty Cook and Heather Collins, are sisters. Heather was married to Elizabeth's father, Drew Collins, and the couple had four children, Elizabeth being one of them. They seem to be a very typical American family with hardworking religious parents raising a bunch of children. Heather's mother, Wilma, came over for four or five hours most days to help out. Heather's sister, Misty, was also married. She's married to a guy named Dan Morrissey, 
Now, at the time that the girls vanished, Misty and Dan were estranged and had been separated for years. Lyric lived with her grandmother, Wilma Cook, who, as we have already established, is Misty and Heather's mom. Lyric and her cousin Elizabeth played together nearly every day when Wilma went over to the Collinses to help out. Well, let's get back to that Friday, the 13th, July, 2012. Here's how the events went down according to multiple interviews with the family and articles about the family. Wilma took Lyric over to the Collins' house around breakfast time. Now, Drew Collins left the house in Evansdale early that morning to go to work at the tree trimming company that he owns. Heather Collins had an appointment, and she wanted to run some other errands. So her mom, Wilma, came over and brought Lyric with her as usual. Wilma stayed home with the kids while Heather went out. And Lyric and Elizabeth set off around 1130 for a bike ride. This was something they routinely did. And the girls were expected to stay within a short distance of the house. Now, Captain, we covered this back in April of 2020 in episodes 393 and 394. And one thing we talked about concerning this bike ride. Right. And we already established that it's a usual, typical activity for the girls to enjoy together is there was no real clearly defining boundaries on where they could not go with their bike ride, but it was established that they were to stay close to the home. And the grandmother stated that she could go outside, call the girls names, they would respond and they would return to the house. So while we don't have any clear defining boundaries here. What we do have is a situation where she's saying, stay close enough that you can hear me. And then if I need you to come back to the house, you come back to the house. But we know how kids are. They sometimes push boundaries. They forget about boundaries or they think they see a window of opportunity of, oh, they won't miss us for 15 minutes or 20 minutes. Let's go check this spot out. Right. So it's widely been reported that the grandmother saw the the two girls zipping by on their bikes around 12, 15. Yeah, and this is, you hear these little parts of these stories, and that's what makes them even more sad and tragic. When you're kind of picturing this, you think to yourself, this seems like a very happy situation, Right. right? Even though we have kind of a not ideal situation with Lyric's parents, But she's a happy kid living with grandma and regularly goes over to her cousin's house and is watched by grandma and gets to hang out with her cousin, who also happens to be one of her very best friends. Mm -hmm. So this is a very ideal situation for these kids and a a great way to be spending their summer months out of school. It reminds you of a scene from a movie, and I know the, the movies are written about real life, but just this moment where the grandmother's outside and the sun is shining and her grandkids are playing on their bikes and she watches them ride by right before tragedy hits. Mm. Yeah. The good parts of it remind me of my childhood when the days of summer, when you're this young, they just seemed endless, like you're outside just playing forever. But what we have here, Captain, is you're right. We have tragedy that is about to occur. Panic is about to set in. And this will start, and it probably starts at a very small level and then ramps up from there, right? Mm -hmm. But this is all going to commence when the girls do not come back from this bike ride. And when they don't return, we have concern that's going to set in. So what we do know is that we have... Grandma Wilma says she saw the girls. She noted the time. It was about 1215 in the afternoon when she saw them riding around on their bikes. And we do know we don't have an exact time of when Heather returns to the house, but it's after the last time that Wilma sees the girls. And both have stated it was shortly after that. One thing I find interesting here, too, is we have this very well-defined timeline that we're going to continue on for this day. This timeline is so key and so very important to this case. 
But when we have the statements of grandma and mother stating it's about 1215 when I last saw the girls, Heather comes home shortly after that. This is a small town. One thing that does not happen is when Heather's returning home, she doesn't cross paths with the girls. She doesn't see her daughter and her niece at any time when she's returning to the house. Well, the next time they're spotted is between 1230 and one o'clock and they're spotted on Gilbert Drive, which is a mile and a half to two miles away from their their mother's house. Yes, so they could be in an opposite direction than what Heather was traveling. The key thing, though, here is that we know that Heather returns to the house before one o'clock. So we got a small window of time, 1215-ish to about one o'clock. And the reason that we know one o'clock is a time marker is because Heather says she gets home. The girls aren't there. She's immediately concerned, but she's not in panic, like thinking anything terrible has happened. Both the girls, Heather and Wilma, all had stuff scheduled for later that day, very shortly after this time period, in fact. And so they were all going to kind of go their separate ways and do the things that they needed to achieve that day, things that the girls were actually looking forward to. Right. So when they didn't return, of course, Wilma and Heather started to get nervous. Now, our one o'clock time marker comes in because what we are told by Wilma and Heather is that by one o'clock, Heather sent out her older son, Kelly, to scout out the area, to go find the girls, tell them to come home. Hey, you were supposed to be home a while ago. But he returns home reporting that he could not find them. He didn't see them, could, didn't find any sign of them at all. At this point, we have... One of the fathers is back at the house, Drew. He stopped at home. This is something he would often do. He owns the tree trimming company. He's in charge of his schedule. Often he would drop by for a quick lunch. Heather told Drew that she was going to go out and look for the girls. Again, you can tell by all of this and the way that it's playing out that nobody is overly concerned at this point. They're just kids that are probably not where they should be or lost track of time and should have came home earlier, but did not. It happens a lot when you have siblings. Hey, your your little brother, your little sister, they're, they're playing with their friends somewhere. I can't find them. Can you get on your bike and go look around because the girls are on the bike? And now you escalate it more to go, okay, well, you keep looking. You, you ride your bike around, keep looking. I'm going to now drive the neighborhood to try to find them. Yeah, and growing up, Unless we had something to do or had some place to be in the summer months, my parents did not care where I was. They did not care if I was outside all day long and I would often be busy. And the only indicators of time that I really had was there was somebody in the neighborhood that would ring like a lunch bell, like a, you know, dinner bell, lunch bell for the kids to come running back and grab some lunch. And so I always knew that would be like around noon or one ish. And then after that, it was like, you would start seeing the parents come home between five, six, six thirty, and then sundown. Those were like the three things that told me about what time it was because I couldn't care any less what time it was as long as I was out having a good time. Well, and especially there in a small town, so you would you would definitely feel the traffic of people coming home, and then you'd feel the calmness of once everybody got home, and then obviously the calmness of uh, of night setting in. So Kelly, the older son who's sent out by Heather and Wilma to go looking for the girls, he comes back, he goes out around one o'clock, does not find the girls. Now we have a situation where adults are going to start paying attention to time. And we have Heather who says she got into her car at one twenty, and she herself started driving around canvassing the neighborhood, going to Elizabeth's school and the softball field, but saw no sign of the girls. So you can see what's happening here. We're starting to fan out, right? go out a little bit further and further looking for the girls because we've covered some ground already and nobody has seen them. Nobody's been able to locate them. Misty, remember she's Lyric's mother, says Wilma called her at work around 2 p.m. to tell her that they could not find the girls. So Misty called her ex, Dan Morrissey. They're still technically married at this time, but again, they've not been together for quite some time from my understanding. 
Dan is living at his mother's home in Waterloo. Now, we have three more people that will be joining the search rather quickly. So this is Dan, who is the other father, his son Dylan, who was at home with Dan that day, and his mother Vicky. So we got three people that show up now to assist in looking for the girls. Misty leaves work and went over to her sister's house just a short distance away. I don't have a time marker for that, but we know that she receives the call around 2 p.m. And she lives very close to where her sister lives. But this is becoming a scary situation. At this time, Heather is still out driving around. And she returns home around 2.20, unfortunately empty-handed, and does not have any information either about where the girls are. At this point, the family began driving all over Evansdale. We got multiple family members, multiple cars out driving around all over Evansdale looking for both girls. Well, panic is also probably starting to set in. What's weird, and this will only be weird because later we will have some information that will make this strange, but they ended up at Myers Lake. This was around 245. And in fact, they're at Myers Lake. They see other people there and they start asking people whether they had seen two little girls on bikes. Now, there is a man that they speak to and he says he was walking on the trail and he said he did, in fact, see two little girls on bikes. He said they were traveling west on the bike trail, but the time that he saw them was unclear. He was a little uncertain of the time. Meanwhile, Heather made the decision to go to the Evansdale Police Department sometime between 2.30 and 3 p.m. And, you know, kudos to her because some people feel like, oh, these are just kids being kids. We'll find them. We shouldn't bother the police with it. No, I think as soon as you start getting nervous, as soon as you start panic setting in, as the captain said, that's when you, you get somebody else involved. I agree. That's what they're there for. Let them know we can't find our kids. We're concerned. Can you help? And like you said, Heather is going to go to the police to report the girls missing. She's at the police department around 2.30 to 3 p.m. Most reports that we have seen have the time of her in-person visit to the Evansdale PD at 2.48 p.m. Three Evansdale squad cars. After After Heather's there, she explains the situation. Three Evansdale squad cars we're now scouring the area and checking, not just checking the area, they go and check the home first and start fanning out from there. Within half an hour, we have Black Hawk Sheriff's deputies and Evansdale firefighters joining in on the effort, on the search effort. Well, I like this a lot because, like you said, they go back and search the family home. They're not taking anybody's word for anything, and that's not and as law enforcement, that's what you're supposed to do. Hey, our our uh, little girls are missing. They were on their bikes. Okay, well, let's start in the house. Let's look, make sure nothing happened in the house. And then we, we go from there. Yeah, and that seems silly. Some people were probably thinking, well, they, they wasted a little bit of time here. And no, that's that's common practice. I cannot tell you, I've, I've had... 10 to a dozen officers tell me that when we get a missing persons call, if it's a little kid, Mm -hmm. 90% of the time, believe it or not, we find them inside the home. They're hiding somewhere in the home or everybody went out looking for little Johnny. And while they were out looking, he came back home. Yeah. He's just hanging out in his room. (laughs) Well, unfortunately, that does not seem to be the situation here. And things are going to go from scary to incredibly scary scary within a matter of minutes because Elizabeth's purse and both of the girls bicycles were found on a trail in the southeast corner of Myers Lake around 4 p.m. that afternoon.
we are back. Cheers, mates. Cheers, mates. Tall cans in the air. Cheers to you, Captain. Mm-hmm. Just before the break, we said that the purse of one of the girls, both of the bicycles belonging to the girls, were found on a trail in the southeast corner of Myers Lake around 4 p.m. that afternoon. Now, we already stated earlier that the family, some of the family members went to that area, to that Myers Lake location, and were looking for the girls even before they were officially reported missing to law enforcement. And this area is rather big. So just because they were there before does not mean that the bikes weren't already in that location. You know, the parents then report them missing. The police start looking for the girls. They start by looking at the house. And of course, this is one of those situations that I wish I could tell you that they found the girls at the house that day. Instead, what we find are the bikes and the purse, but no Elizabeth, no lyric to be found. And unfortunately, the finding of the bikes and the purse does not really give them any clues as to where the girls could have been. No, other than the fact that they were out of their boundaries. Let's talk about what we know about where the bikes were found. So this Myers Lake covers 27 acres with water and is about 25 feet deep at its deepest parts. The lake is a major recreational area for the people of Evansdale. It's stocked with fish, has a boat ramp, there's restrooms there, a playground, picnic areas with a grill, all things that you would expect to see at a large park. It's very scenic, but it also has a really nice paved bike path winding its way through three quarters of a mile around the lake. According to a report in the Globe Gazette, the girls' bikes were found on the Evansdale Nature Trail right at the southeastern tip of the lake between two lines of chain link fence by the maintenance gate leading to a rock jetty and a water outlet on the lake. This gate was not locked. Photos show that this area of the paved nature trail is straight and with the fence on both sides and the trees overhead, it has almost like a tunnel appearance, right? Picture that you have fencing on both sides. You have the trees overhead and underneath you have this paved scenic trail, bike trail. Right. According to the girl's aunt, Tammy, The bikes were found about 12 feet from the edge of the water on the trail. This will lead to the suspicion that the police have early on in the investigation. That being that the girls went into the lake and may have drowned or had some kind of accident in the lake. We can circle back to that in a minute. The investigators also found Elizabeth's purple purse and cell phone. Now, we need to note that this phone does not have any type of service. From my understanding, it was just used for games. It was used for her to play games. Now, Captain, when we covered this two years ago, well, more than two years ago now, you brought up some interesting questions about this phone. And we wanted to know if she could have been using this phone to communicate with anyone. And I unfortunately do not have those answers. That still remains unclear to this day. Mm. As we all know, it doesn't require service if she's in an area that she has Wi-Fi and if the phone has Wi-Fi capabilities. Right. And she likely did have Wi-Fi capabilities to be playing certain games on that phone. Doesn't doesn't require them to play all of them, but certainly some of them, yes. But if you have internet connection to play those games, you have internet connection to possibly communicate with somebody. But to break down where they find the the bikes, simply to me, if, if I'm in law enforcement or I'm part of the family searching, I'm seeing this scene of the bikes and the person going, this is not good. Oh. This, I, I'm leaning towards something really bad happened at this point. Yeah, if I see this scene, I I agree with their concern of, well, maybe they ended up in the lake. You know, they're 10, they're 8 years old, they're young. That could be the situation. The family's quick to point out to law enforcement, both of the girls knew how to swim. 
The other thing that the family was concerned about when the thought of drowning in the lake came up was the family was quick to point out, look, none of their clothing, none of their shoes are found. We would expect our kids to take their shoes off at the very least before going into the lake. It was a very hot day that day. I mean, it was middle of July. So the lake makes some sense, but I'm with you, Captain. If I see these bikes abandoned sitting here, when I was a kid, I didn't go anywhere without, if I left my bike unattended, it was in my friend's front yard or in somebody's garage. It wasn't just leaving it in a public place where I couldn't turn and look to see my bike at any time because I was, you had a nice mongoose bike. I had a dyno. We all had bikes that we didn't want somebody to come along and snatch. Well, it's also your biggest possession at the time. Yeah, that's true. That's true. It was like my Corvette. Uh, for my 10 year old Corvette, but, but for everybody, for every kid, that's like the biggest thing that you have, the most expensive, and you're not going to just leave that. So once you see these bikes laying on the side of the path, you, you look around and you don't see any, any signs of them anywhere. This is bad. And this is the other thing that scares me too, is the purse. I think the purse might scare me more than finding the bikes. So the way that this is described is that the purse was on the lake side of the fence, about 10 feet to the east of where the bikes were found. And about two feet from the fence, officials said, now this location is interesting to me as cars can't get to this spot. So what I mean by that is these bikes are found in a location where Someone couldn't just pull up and snatch and grab the girls, you know, snatch them off of their bikes at this spot and drive off. To me, that's weird, right? I, and I get maybe that's kind of why they were honing in on the lake possibility early on. There's a lot of accidents, especially with children with water. But, and it doesn't have to be that they went swimming. It could just be simply that they're going to put their toes in the water and then something mm-hmm. bad happened. Right. And we spent a lot of time talking about the searching of the lake in our original coverage. So if you want to check that out and some of the other details that we won't get into this time around because we covered it so good before, those are episodes 393 and 394. We're going to try to awesome. Well, but this time what we will want to do is to dive into some things that weren't discussed that we didn't get to or anything that has changed in our thoughts and feelings about this case since that time. Well, that's one of the things that I find very fascinating with these cases that aren't solved right away. And we're we're coming up on 10 years, but these cases, maybe they don't have answers, but they continue to evolve. Right. And when these girls are missing and this case first broke, we had some decent coverage of this missing person's case on the Nancy Grace show. And I found both of these accounts to be very insightful regarding where the bikes were found and a description of how the uh, bikes were when, when found. And this comes from two reporters. So the first reporter was a, a man named Jim Spellman and Spellman said, what I find so fascinating is the geography of where the bikes were found, because again, it's this kind of dead end area. And if there was an abduction that happened, how would you get two girls all of the way to the end of, and he cuts off and then says, it's a 10 minute walk from the end of this bike path at the very least to the end of where you might be able to get to a car or something like that. Okay. That's awfully insightful. Think about the distance that that must be from where the location of the bikes were to where you could possibly have any type of vehicle to put the girls into and drive off with them. He's saying in his opinion that at the very least, he believes it to be about a 10 minute walk from where the bikes were found to the end of the bike path where a car or a vehicle would be. And I'm not trying to crap all over their point because I do think it's important to point out, but the girls could have already put down their bikes and they could be walking around the water. So at the time of abduction, if they were abducted by that area and put into a vehicle or 
cohort, you know, coerced into a vehicle or or threatened to get into the vehicle, they could have already been closer to to that side, easier area to be abducted. Well, yeah, and I don't think that this means I I just like hearing the details of getting a better description of where these bikes were found by this Jim Spellman because I don't think that it indicates that they weren't abducted at this location. As you pointed out, they could have been on foot. They could have set their bikes down just to look around, mill about, what have you. Someone, bad guy, crosses their path, decides to take them and walks them, controls them, lures them, coerces them to his vehicle, which is 10 minutes away. It is fascinating to me, though, that in the course of that walk, we don't have an eyewitness or an ear witness that says they saw something strange. They saw something troubling or heard anything of concern around that time. Right. The thing again, though, to me with the purse that scares me is the purse, the way that it's described almost sounds like you have the bikes here. And I know the purse is only like 10 feet away, but the way that that description reads to me, Captain, is that the purse is on the other side of the fence. Well, chill out. You're already getting a Colonel fire pants. And it, that to me sounds like, mm. oh, snap. Either these kids like hop the fence and then something bad happened when they got over there. She immediately drops her purse. That seems unlikely. What seems more likely to me is if, in fact, the location of where the bikes were found if that is in direct relation to the abduction site, if they were abducted there, this purse, its location, it feels like to me, like, like a perpetrator grabbed it with the, and tossed it with the attention of, of tossing it as far as he could, or, or just tossing it out of the area to free up an additional hand to control the girls. It, it, it seems, it seems all very weird. It's a, it's a very strange Mm-hmm. situation to kind of try to dissect. Now, another reporter, his name is Jesse Gavin, went on to discuss the likelihood of someone abducting the girls from the highway side of the trail. Right. You have these fences, right, that are on both sides of this bike trail. On one side of one fence is the lake. On one side of the other fence is the highway. So we already have this other reporter who's talking a little bit about where the bikes were found, but this reporter's talking in direct relation to the highway side of the trail. And they go on to say, apparently there was a hole in the fence somewhere along this section of the trail that was the result of a man losing control of his car on the highway and crashing through the fence. So this is not a complete fence at this point due to some damage from this single car accident. The reporter said, quote, well, like Jim said, it wouldn't be the most likely scenario. Obviously, that is kind of an area that's closed off to main roads since it's a bike trail. Obviously, it's very close to an interstate, but it would be kind of tough to get to that interstate. The other thing you've got to keep in mind about that interstate is it's being worked on right now. There's a lot of construction activity going on right there. So there's going to be backed up traffic. Traffic is going to be slowed down. So any kind of suspicious activity that happens in that area, it's going to be seen by somebody. It's going to be seen by a lot of people. People driving along the highway would surely have noticed a car stopped along the roadside and possibly two little girls entering or being placed in a vehicle after walking through a hole in the fence. He goes on to say and remind us all that after all, it was broad daylight. Back to your point about the the purse being 10 feet away to me. Okay. If it's on the other side of the fence, fine, but just it being 10 feet away, it kind of shows that these bikes weren't placed down that the, that the purse wasn't just placed down. Cause if, if I'm riding a bike and I have a purse and I and I get off the bike and I don't want to carry the purse around, I'm just going to lay it right down beside the bike. Yeah, and the thing here, too, that I, I want to kind of throw out there is just because the bikes are found there and the purse was found there, and ultimately we know that they are found dead, unfortunately, many miles away from this Myers Lake location. So an abduction 
is the only thing that makes sense. But just because the bikes and the purse are found in this location doesn't mean that that's exactly where or has to be where the abduction took place. You, no, because let's say the abduction took place in a in, um, close-by neighborhood. The abduction happens, gets the girls into the vehicle, has their bikes with them in the vehicle, goes down to this park, grabs both of their grabs both of their bicycles. It's a 10-minute walk, dumps them there to, to throw people off. Hey, now look around this park. Like you said, it was, what do you say, 20-some acres big? Mm-hmm. I mean that's a that's a big area to start searching. That that kind of throws people off the scent. Yeah, the thing here too is, you know, if somebody knows that area, let's pretend for a moment that the abductor knows this area somewhat well. They don't even have to know it very well actually at all. I would I would think looking at the 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 location and where this kind of takes place. But if you have the ability to do so, it, w- it would be difficult because if you just abducted two girls, now you have all these moving parts and pieces of trying to conceal the bikes at the same time. But if you had the ability to control them and conceal the bikes at the same time, it does make a lot of sense, right? Maybe the girls were abducted close by the road or right at the roadside before even getting to that bike trail. And that bike trail's right there, and you go, you know what? If mom and dad or anybody comes looking for these girls, they're going to be out in a vehicle driving around looking for the girls. And if the bikes are found right here by the roadside, they're going to be alerted to something bad immediately. At the very least, I could take these bikes and tuck them away back in the middle of this trail here where they wouldn't be seen from the road, and whoever's out looking for these girls will just keep driving. Yeah, that's an excellent point, knowing that people will be searching from a car and what is going to be in their eyesight. So we spend all this time here, Captain, talking about what were the girls' bikes doing by Myers Lake anyway. And we should be pointing out here as well that Myers Lake is not extremely close to their home. In fact, it's it's beyond wherever that imaginary line was that the girls were allowed to be riding their bikes. And this is according to the family. Myers Lake is one and a half miles away from the Collins's house. Again, the girls were not supposed to be riding there. Misty Cook said on Nancy Grace's show, they are not allowed to just ride freely for hours or until dark. They do have a little bit of freedom. So they're allowed to go, you know, maybe two or three blocks away and stay within those blocks. An hour check back in is kind of the standard that we hold with them and mostly they stick to it. So it was surprising to see that they had come this far. If indeed they did ride this far, she's obviously referring to the lake. Misty also said in an interview this with KWWL.com, I'm surprised they rode their bikes this far, but their kids and later Heather and Drew Collins told the media that they did not believe the girls would have biked that far on their own. Well, this is leading to what you were saying before about maybe that the perpetrator then took their bikes and and placed them in this area on purpose. If in this, you know, these cases, they're not, there's all kinds of horrible possibilities that we, that we have to kind of talk about and, and go over here. And so a lot of this is not comfortable to say. A lot of this is not comfortable to hear. But if you have a situation where the girls are incapacitated, a single offender would have the ability to move those bikes. The other thing, too, is if you had complete control of the victims, you might have the possibility of having them move the bikes for you at your direction. Right. Or if there's more than one offender... One offender is staying with the girls, wherever that location be, likely a vehicle, while the other offender is moving these items that they don't want to have any part of. But not out of the realm of possibility that they rode their bikes this far, because if this eyewitness is correct, they saw them a mile and a half to two miles away from their home on Gilbert Drive. Correct. And correct me if I'm wrong here, Captain. This reminds me a little bit of the West Memphis 3 case 
a lot. Didn't we have a situation there where the bikes were concealed? Yes. And some theorize that the bikes were concealed maybe even after the boys were already attacked to later kind of hinder finding the victims at all. Because if you find the bikes in that location, then one would start to go, well, maybe they are here somewhere or well, then, were here in this location at some point. Yeah. And in that case, there, there was a pipeline and that pipeline really kind of signaled to everybody that that's the back half of the woods. So I think having those bikes being seen at the pipeline, it was like, the, the perpetrators are leaving the crime scene. They see the bikes and they go, okay, well, we need to hide these because this is basically an advertising sign to go go back there and look. But not just that. Just, uh, I mean, different in some ways because in this case there was no school today. And, and they're out riding their bikes. And, and so the timeline, I think, is a little more blurry because – at least when you have a case where children get home from school, you have a definitive starting point. I'm not saying that I don't believe anybody in their family, but you have to uh, question question everything in this case. Well, there we do have a situation, and you're right, Captain. The situation is this. We have Grandma who is in charge of essentially five kids at that time. Right. And so, yes, I don't believe that these times are spot on. I do believe that they're fairly accurate. And I say that based off of the fact that we have such a short window of time. So even if the times are off, they can't be off by so much because we have a lot of activity happening really within the course of four and a half hours. Because she says that they left the house on their bikes around 1130. And then she says that she believes she saw the two kids still alive and well, riding around on their bikes at 1215. We have those other possible sightings, other uh, sightings of the girls on their bikes. We have the bikes being found by family and law enforcement at 4 p.m. So that gives us just that little window of four and a half hours. Now, after the bikes were found, fortunately, the family sitting there watching as crime scene tape is being put in place. The officers are closing off access to this trail so they can scour the area and look for more evidence or look for anything at all, any clues that might tell them where the girls could be. Right. Investigators spent several hours out of sight. You know, they're they're in on this trail, down on the trail where the bikes were, but the family members cannot see them. Again, it's about a 10-minute walk from where the bikes were to where uh, the trail kind of ends and pops out there. While this is going on, the family members held a vigil outside of the taped off area. If anything other than the bikes or Lyric's purse were found, and we know the phone was found, it has never been disclosed. And just to be clear, and and I I feel bad because I'm jumping back in time here a little bit, but when you're talking about that the grandmother's time might not be completely accurate i don't think in any way i don't get the sense that it's she's not accurate because she's lying or trying to cover anything up i just think it's because she's simply in charge of multiple kids and there's a lot going on she's busy yeah she's busy and the other thing we need to point out too those other eyewitnesses that said they saw the girls on their bikes and a little further from the home at later times in 1215, that kind of backs up Wilma's story that, that what she says did in fact happen. And if in fact, 1215 was the last time that she saw them, well then Wilma couldn't have done anything to these girls. She's not responsible for anything here because we have other eyewitnesses that see them after the fact, those other eyewitnesses tell me that nothing weird Nothing strange went on inside the home, and later somebody's trying to conceal what happened by getting rid of the girls, getting rid of the bikes, staging some kind of scenario to look like something else took place. Right. Now, continuing on our timeline for Friday the 13th, by 4.40 p.m., we have emergency calls that are going out to the residents of Evansdale. This is to notify them of the missing girls, right? 
We have two girls that are missing. We need help finding them. If you see either girl, call us, tell us, let us know. Officers also began canvassing the lake neighborhoods and the media was notified by 5.30 p.m. So a lot of things are taking place very rapidly here. And I like to see all of this activity and all of this effort. We have boats that were put into the water on Myers Lake that begin scanning the surface. We have divers with a local search and rescue organization that are called in to start searching the lake. Police and firefighters from the bigger city of Waterloo next door. They come by and they are now assisting the Black Hawk County Sheriff's deputies as well as the Evansdale Police Department. And we also get the Iowa State Police that joined in on searching wooded areas. So there's a lot of wooded areas in this general location. And many people stayed out searching all night long. They even brought in some Lano Richie. They brought in a plane so they could do some searches from from the air. And now we have the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children that were notified of the girls' disappearance by 8 p.m. By by the next morning, we have a representative from the National Center of Missing and Exploited Children on the ground in Evansdale, boots on the ground in Evansdale assisting in the search for the girls. Thanks for joining us here in the garage. We have so much more to get to tomorrow. So join us back here. Same bat time, same bat channel. That's right, Captain. Such an intriguing case. Such a tragic case. Join us back here in the garage tomorrow. Until then, be good, be kind, and don't lose.